Hello and welcome to the two-man power trip of wrestling. I am your host, JP John Paz, and joining me today is a former WWE referee. He worked for the WWE for over 30 years. He is Mr. Mike Kyoto. Mike, welcome in to the two-man power trip. Yeah, thanks for having me on, John. Appreciate it. John Paz, what's happening? Hey, not too much. I know we were just kind of talking off air. Fellow Jersey boy, which is awesome. Yeah, right? Fellow Jersey boy. Born in Bayonne, raised up in Cherry Hill in 74. Missing Jersey a little bit, but I've been kind of away from Jersey for a while. So I was in Texas for about 13, 14 years and now in Tampa, Florida. So enjoying the weather here. Oh, I was wondering why you had that Texas number. I was like, oh, Texas. Oh, I yeah. didn't realize you live in Texas. Okay. Yeah, I was in Houston for about 13, 14 years over there. Oh, nice. Okay. Jersey, Texas. Interesting. And yeah, Florida. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> now in Florida. Yeah. Warm weather. That's it. Better beaches here, too. So it's nice. Join the Tampa. Three wrestling hotbeds, too. That's true. That is true. That is true. Now, when I think of like New Jersey and wrestling, I think of like, like Gorilla Monsoon, Joey Morella, you know, obviously oh, yeah. Bam Bam, Candido and stuff, but you yeah. kind of broke in under Gorilla, right? Yep. Yeah, under Gorilla Monsoon and uh, broke in, started doing a ring crew when I was a teenager, 15, 16 years old. Doing uh, That's when Gorilla had his own little territory from Vince Sr. And he had a ring and, and Victor Kionez used to run a ring crew and Joey Morella used to work at Tony Chimel and I. And used to make good money. We used to make 300, 400, 500 bucks a night working, selling programs and doing a ring crew and robes and you know, all the other stuff. So I grew up with the old school wrestlers and did that. And I went back full time when I was about 18. That's awesome. What was the name of the promotion with the uh, gorilla? Well, no, it was, gorilla just had his own territory. He's, he worked for Vince senior for the world wrestling federation, but it was oh. just he owned a territory. He did like spectrum. Wildwood, New Jersey, every Monday at the convention center on, on the boardwalk there every Monday in the summer times. Um, he did Salisbury, Maryland. Kind of, we kind of had like the a little Northeast territory, Allentown, Pennsylvania and all that. So he just had a little territory and he used to work all the ring crew. That's before Vince McMahon took over. This is when Vince Sr. owned it. So you were kind of working for the WWWF, really? That's correct. Yeah, I, I did. I did work for the WWF when we came when I came back full time in 1819. So and it was World Wrestling Federation at that time as well. Were you always a big fan? Was that like your you know life's goal to get in the business? I was a big fan of sports, baseball, football, uh, wrestling intrigued me. Hogan intrigued me, you know, uh, Gorilla Monsoon and Big John Studd and a lot of the old school wrestlers used to see and a lot of wrestlers used to come over to Gorilla Monsoon's house. It was like the Samoans and this and a lot of guys came over and um, over to Gorillas once in a while in Jersey. And, you know, I was intrigued with the size of wrestlers, like how big they were and how small and Andre the Giant. It was like, you know, you see an Andre, it was like, you've never seen anybody like that before in your life, you know? How was Gorilla, like personally? How was he as a great man? Guy, great guy. And he was very straight up and gave me a lot of words of wisdom in his business. Um, a lot of, lot of wisdom that I took from him. In the business, you know, growing up and stuff in this business, just his his uh, his wisdom paid off, and his words were to me like, "Hey, I want you to be you should be a referee. Uh, referees, the longevity in this business. That's what I want Joey's, you know, to do. And you know, fortunately, Joey's been past now twenty something years, and um, you know, and that's and then he was he was right, you know, because he said if you want to be a wrestler, because I was always in the ring trying to take bumps with the guys and Steve Lombardi and Barry Horowitz and these guys and and uh, just messing around the ring, you know, like during the day before the show. And he'd be like, well, what are you doing there bumping like a wrestler? I said, well, I'll just learn how to bump, sir, you know. And he goes, look, I told you, he goes, you want to be a referee? Be a referee. You're not one of the boys. I want to see you be a referee if you want. And then you'll have a longevity and you'll have a good career. Some of these wrestlers have a five, 10-year span. Some wrestlers have a good 20, 30-year span. But most of them have a good five-year run, 10 and they're done. He goes, you referee, you could be refereeing for many years. And it's true, three decades. So how do you kind of break in and start, like, training to be referees? Is that under Joey Morello's wing? That was under Joey Morello's wing. Like, his wing teaching me um, old school wrestlers. I mean, I was in the ring with George Animal Steel, um, Greg the Hammer Valentine. There was so many, Rick Rude and so many old school guys. And just everybody, if they liked you, they taught, you know, they taught you. And, you know, they told you what they wanted, how to work as a, you know, with a heel, how to work with a baby face. And, uh, you know, and I, 
of course, years ago was a lot more, uh, there was a lot more stuff to it. Like there was gimmicks and stuff like that. Like a referee used to have to play games with the gimmicks of what, you know, you'd put something behind his back. He'd, he'd show it in the air that he's yeah. got something when the referee's turned and then you would go check the wrestler. Then he puts it somewhere else. I mean, it was just a lot more, there was a lot more things learned. Learning from the old school is probably the best school I ever went to. For when you're, when you're doing that, are you in with like the wrestlers also? Like when you're training, I used to say those guys like around George Steele and Valentine, but like, are yeah. you bumping at all? Like, what are you doing as far as like training for refs? No, you would just, you would just uh, be in there every day working. Work. As far as back in them days, in the, in the 80s, you would just, you would go out there and learn. There was no school. And it was weird because like it, all the wrestlers in the 80s seemed like they had character. A lot of them had character and they loved to wear the flamboyant robes and their nice gear and stuff like that. And took so much pride in their character, you know? And, you know, at that point, and even in the eighties, people really didn't know whether it was fake or real, you know, cause they'd see it and they go, okay, that's fake. Oh, that was real. You know? So, I mean, growing up with, uh, just doing matches after matches after matches and chief J Strombo and Rene Goulet and Jack Lonzo, your agents and Grizzly, Smith and a lot of the uh, old school agents would help you out and tell you what you're doing wrong and what you're doing right. When you are kind of like going through the motions and stuff, is it really like, let's just say it's your first match. They just throw you out there and they're like, okay, just fend for yourself. Like go, yeah. go, yes. you know, go get it. That's exactly what it was, you know? And like, but a lot of wrestlers like back then and they still do today and they talk to each other. And we used to talk Carney and they taught you how to speak Carney so that people wouldn't understand what you're saying or when you're on TV and stuff. Um, so we you know, spoke a lot of Carnival Car Carney and, um, and they just taught you and it just, it just got thrown out. Like one day I showed up, I mean, I was doing the ring crew. We were there all day, Tony Chimmel and I, and he was the ring announcer and, and chief J said, Hey, I want you to get a black shirt, a black pants, blue shirt, a black bow tie. You're going to start reffing. And then he paid me an extra 300 bucks that night on top of all my crew pay. And I went, Ooh, this is not too bad. <laughs> yeah. Like this. So, and you know, it was fun, a lot of fun, like uh learning. And there was a lot of stress over the years, too, because you didn't want to screw up somebody's match because they took it so personally. And um, you know, they took it really strong that if they got buried and it made them look stupid and you didn't cut them off in time, a heel or a baby face to get to another guy or certain things, and if you got buried, you would look stupid, it would put the heat on you, not the heel. So there was a lot of, you know, a lot of guys that taught me right. Learning from the old school. I mean, he couldn't, couldn't go wrong there. Yeah, that's great. And it's really learning on the job. I mean, like you said, there was no, like, let's train and stuff. Like, they kind of no. throw you the wolves. No, it's not. It's not like the PC. Now, you go to the PC, you train there, you, you learn there for quite a few years, if not months and years, before you even come up to the WWE's, you know, staff to, like, either the SmackDown or the, or the Raw roster. Now, as you're kind of going along, do you remember what like your first match was that you refereed, or is that something you're yeah. like, eh, it's long? It was Barry Horowitz and the Brooklyn Brawler. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yes. And that guy, Barry Horowitz, I loved him. He was he was a character because he used to he used to shine them boots up every day. His his gear used to have to be picture perfect every day. And then Brawler's gear was just like ripped up and you know, like just yep he was like yeah it's, i haven't washed it in a week <laughs> but yeah those two guys were fun to work with when i first started barry's still in great shape is he really yeah yeah i was wondering how he's been doing i you know, i asked around and nobody's really knows what's going on with him but that's good he's in great shape still awesome yeah, I booked him about two years ago, but I've talked to him since then. He said he does like the same workout regimen every day. Like, I don't know if it's OCD or whatever, but he just does stuff and he's like, yeah, st staying in shape. He, nah, and, that's, good. that's awesome to hear yeah. that. Because, yeah, he was, he was very OCD with his gear and everything. Yep. And he had to be like, everything was picture perfect. It was, he's a great guy, though. He was a good guy. It's funny, he almost took the OCD into like the workout. Like, I got to do this and I'll stay in shape. And he just does the same thing. And he looks great. I mean, he looks right. a lot younger than his age. He really is. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, because he's got to be up there. He's got to be 60 some years old, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Well, that's good to hear. That's awesome to hear. Yeah, he's doing good. A uh, brawler seems like he's doing good. He seems like he's in great shape, too. Uh, I guess yeah, brawler's got to stay in shape and stuff. He keeps busy. He's a good yep. guy, too. He's always hustled, you know. Fortunately, the company let him go a few years back and stuff. And, you know, 
I don't know why I thought he'd be around forever too, but uh, so did I. I thought I'd be around forever, but things happen. Right. I definitely want to talk about that, get back into that. But first, how'd you actually get in though? Is Gorilla kind of opening the door saying, hey, we have a job for a referee and yeah, that's how you I mean, get in? Gorilla got me, you know, got me, spoke to somebody in the office and then, um, and then uh, Terry Garvin, it was just taken over at the time. Um, Terry Garvin took over ring operations. But um, I started off for about a year on a crew with Tony Chimmel and then, and it was like a tryout period almost for like eight months to a year. And then I got put on the books, Was uh, went on salary for ring crew and stuff like that. And I was the salary and, and just went on from there. Just, they just want to check you out for a year if you can handle the road or whatever. And uh, of course, in all our years, we've never missed one shot unless it was weather permitting canceled or something else. But we never missed one shot with the ring crew. That's a great record to have. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, when you're doing like the ring crew, where is like the ring? Is it always set up at the same point? You kind of dismantle it and then take it to the next place with in the same truck? Or how does that all work? Yeah, we had a truck based out of New Jersey, right in our Willingboro, New Jersey. So Mount near Mount Laurel, New Jersey. So we had a truck there. It's stationed there all the time. So we'd, we'd get in, leave our cars there at this at this spot. We used to pay to rent the truck, just park it there. And it was just based in this place. And then... uh we take off for 15, 17 days, come back later, and a few days later, go back out, go back out on the road. How so many guys are in the ring crew? It was just, it was just Tony Chimmel and I. And then sometimes wow. we'd be a third guy. And then sometimes we'd have a steel cage with us too. We'd rent the truck, but we had a nice WWF truck or, you know, a nice straight job, like a 26 footer with a sleeper and all that. So, and, um, you know, we, it was just Tony Chimmel and I would go to, you know, back in the day you had, Fans used to have other people helping you. But over the course of the years, you know, unions took over and then we went to buildings with a lot of unions and certain, like always when you went to MSG, it always had a union, Philadelphia, certain other cities. So, um, you know, fortunately, you know, you have union hands helping you and you're just directing and managing and you're working and you're working as well too, all day. Hate working with those unions. I've had some bad experiences working with those. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, they're pretty good. As long as you give them some t-shirts. <laughs> yeah, them there you go. Tickets and t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's all they need. That's great. Yeah, yeah. That's it. So what, like, when do you actually debut? Is it 1989? You, brought, like, get yeah. on TV, TV? Any kind of yeah, debut? 89. Yeah, I was refereeing pretty much like in 87, 86, 87. It took me a couple years to pay the dues. And then get up there, and then that I started my debut in '89 on TV. Uh, 1992 was probably one of my biggest um, venues. It was like 82,000. That's the most memorable venue there, London Wembley Arena, in London, 1992 at SummerSlam. There was about 82,000 people there. And Man, Joey, but... Joey actually had that match with Brett and uh, and Bulldog. It was an unbelievable, like 40 something minute match. So. They tore the house down that night. Very fond memories as a fan watching that show and pay-per-view. I just love that. Yeah. Which yeah. match did you referee that night? That match I did uh the Road Warriors were in a were in a tag match. Oh. So I did that, Joe and Joe and Mike, Joe and Hawk. So and uh did that match. And I did another match too, I believe it was like a six-man tag or something. Now they say Hawk was a little inebriated for that match. Is yeah. that true, false, or a little bit? I don't rumor? think. Yeah, I think that's more of a rumor, you know. Um, yeah, because he, you know, I remember him before the before the match. He was fine in the ring. He was fine. If he was hung over, maybe hung over, but I don't <laughs> think he was. Uh, he wasn't drinking before that night. No. That's quite a great match. They beat Money Inc. or whatever, and just a, a great kind of right. moment uh, yeah. for the, for that time, but. Rocco was like, what the hell? Why is this thing, this little uh, ventriloquist dummy? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, what does this have to do with anything with the Road Warriors? It's so cool. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. I remember the Undertaker uh, entrance was phenomenal that night. Yeah. That was just, that was unbelievable. So, yeah, that was a good show, man. And uh, I remember being out there for about a week before that show because we had to be out there to make sure all the parts for the ring were there. So I had to get out there at least 10 days earlier or something like that before that show. Had a good time in London. Do you ever get nervous? Like there's a big crowd or something like, I know the wrestlers would probably get nervous, but do, do the refs get nervous? Like, oh, I better not screw anything up. Yeah. I mean, you definitely worry about the spots you have, or if you have to take a bump and your time is coming to be there for that bump and you have to make sure it looks good and incidental, not, you know, on purpose or it's just, 
So, I mean, you're, you're stressed a little bit, but when I'm, when I used to get in a ring, it's just after a while, like you just used to block out, block out the whole crowd. And you wouldn't even realize there was 70 or 80,000 or a hundred thousand at WrestleMania. It would just, you would, you would realize it and really digest it when you're coming down the ramp and you're entering the ring and you're looking around and people are just jaw jacking and saying things and chanting and this and that. And you really, you digest it. Once that, that bell rings, you get into his own. I and feel I, like I'd have to say the one time it did mark out was the Rock and Hogan one. <laughs> I was gonna say I feel like sometimes if you're in the ring and it, it's like a Hogan or a Rock or whatever, you're like, right. holy shit, I'm in. Like to me as a fan, I'd be like, holy shit, I'm in there with these guys. Like this yeah. is awesome. I know. You know that was a definite awesome feeling, but when you look at it now, when you look back at the match now, it's like, man, I'm glad to be a part of that match. You know, Icon against Icon. Hogan took the business for so many years and just, you know, and the way that the crowd in Toronto and Canada was, they're unbelievable, the crowd. They're, they're, their fan base is just a lot of respect for wrestling, you know, with the hearts coming out of Canada and so many good wrestlers like Edge and Christian and and so forth. So, uh, you know, it was just, um, it was just a, a one, you know, it was one of the most experiences of my life with the crowd reaction, just on an entrance and a shoulder tackle. You know, and just a big push off. It was like, whoa, we're doing some old school moves here. And we got them. You know, like, they got them. So. It's just amazing. Like, one guy can do like a flippity whatever and like yeah. break his neck, no pop. Hogan goes like this. And like, was, ah. I mean, the place just went nuts that night, though. It was just, it was, it was one of the, you know, I've been through many, many matches and many crowd reactions, which are phenomenal, but that, that one stands out top five that's for sure amazing now there is like a lot of things said about that match because hogan's supposed to be the heel rock supposed to be the baby face did hogan everyone always says hogan knew he was going to get a good reaction did you as the ref did the rock were you guys aware that it might switch the dynamic where hogan's going to be the baby face and rock going to be the heel yeah we didn't know we really didn't know i mean we kind of knew a little bit but not like that i mean i was shocked you know, because, you know, once that music hit, he came out on stage. It was that place erupted. It erupted. And we kind of didn't know which way. I mean, if they did know, if they were 80% sure, they would have put that mass, match on last, I believe. But that match didn't go last that night. So it should have been the main event. So many people have said that. I know people have walked out thinking that, like, that, okay, like, it doesn't get better than this. And they walked out on the show. Yeah. Oh, did they really? Yeah. Wow. It, that's because you still had the had the Chris Jericho, tri, um, you know, in the Triple H match after that, with and that was a title match. Yep. And so I mean, and that's what was phenomenal about that match. There was no title on the line. You know, <laughs> there was no title on the line. That's it. And that's what made it so like just icon against icon. And uh, you always say like you know Hogan passed the torch to Rock. Rock took the torch, and then he little while later went off to Hollywood. That <laughs> went yeah. out we going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's what happened with that. But. It's unbelievable though. If you just think about that match, it's like, okay, it wasn't the main event, but probably should have been. Hogan got such a great reaction. Is anybody in your ear or is Vincent in your ear at all as you're the ref like saying, all right, we got to change this up, like rocks rock act, act like a heel? Or those no, guys just do it. They know what no, they're that, doing. those guys just went out and they just did it. I mean, you know, and you could tell right off the bat with the entrance which way that was going to go, you know, and then especially with the shove off, the stare down and just, you just the reaction of the crowd, you could tell which way it was going. So they were kind of like almost booing rock at some point and doing this and then just blasting for Hogan. And it was just, um, it was just a remarkable night. Just, uh, and like I said, if, if they were, if they were sure they were to put that match on last, but nobody knew really. I mean, I know I didn't and I was shocked at the reaction right off the bat. How do you hide your emotions as a referee? Because if that was me, I'd be like smiling. This is awesome. You know, Hogan, oh shit. I like, how do you hide look, them? Dumb look stare on my face. It was just like, <laughs> you know, like, I was just watching them on a stare off. Like, we got these people already. We haven't even, you haven't even touched. So, um, yeah, it was just, it was unbelievable, man. It was like one of the fantastic moments of my career, professional wrestling.
Now, as far as like being a ref for that match, I think a lot of people, and I've had on Earl uh, Hebner before, I had on Marty Elias, I've had on some other referees, but I'm just always curious, like, what is the importance of the referee to a match like that? Uh, James Beard, too, saying he's very important, the third man in the ring. What's like kind of your importance in that match? Well, the importance is time cues are are an importance, especially going off the air if you were on live pay per view. I mean, now it's a network now, it's a little bit different. Um, the, the important is uh, making sure the guys are good. You're there for your spots. Everybody's healthy. Whoever gets hurt, you got to let the other guy know who's hurt. Um, you got to, the importance is making sure the rules are, are applied to the match and that there are rules. Um, and my importance to that match that night was to make sure I had to be there for that bump when I went outside the ring and I came back in and, and Rock takes me out for a little bit. And, um, I mean, and you got to make sure you're there for the counts. I mean, you just, everything's important as a referee because there's, I mean, there's a lot more to do these days in detail because they're doing a lot more crazy stuff. I mean, this wasn't going to be a high flying match, jumping off the top rope and onto a table and all this. This was just a, you know, a a big icon against icon and they're just going to ground it. They're going to, you know, nobody's going to come off the air, you know, And nobody's going to be leaping and flying. So, but the importance of a referee is has to, it's cues, making sure you're there, your false counts are good. Um, You know, they obey the rules so you don't look stupid and you don't, you don't get buried. I feel like the referee, as a fan, like you don't know, like, oh, what are they doing? What's their role? I feel like it's much more important than the average fan would even think. You know, like, right? You got, you got somebody in your ear, is it Vince or somebody else telling you maybe some things? Right, not yet, and uh, they're telling you a lot of things. Like it's, if Vince goes to the gorilla position, he's right next to the gorilla position, and the gorilla position will feed you all the information there. So, and then it's whatever Vince says, you know, then you're getting it fed right from Billy Kidman or it was Jerry Briscoe years ago or or Gorilla Monsoon. And, I mean, it's just um, over the years. So, it's just you know, you you got to be there for time cues. Make sure guys these days with concussion protocols are huge. Um, blood, when blood's there, you have to put on gloves. You have to make sure you might have to stop the match. You might have to get the doctor to glue it up if it's a deep gash, you know, and so forth. Um, Because they don't like to see a lot of blood in the ring anymore. Um, Sponsors don't want to see that. Um, But, you know, I see AEW's going that way a little bit lately, and I like kind of like that, you know. I mean, they're doing actually some crazy stuff, which uh, I was watching uh, Matt Hardy's match last night with Darby. Yeah, it was a pretty good match, pretty good, intense match, that hardcore match. Yeah, yeah, not not too bad at all. A little crazy with that that finish, though. I mean, that was a little yeah, crazy. That was crazy. I, that was crazy. That kid's good, man. I like that Darby kid. Good kid. With AEW, any plans on returning? Because I know you did, obviously, do a, more than a few matches yeah. for AEW. Yeah, hopefully. If Cody needs to be, it, it calls me. You know, he said when the pandemic, you know, things open up some more. So I know they started hiring, but, you know, hiring big names like Big Show and and Rusev and all that other stuff. So, yeah, hopefully, you know, uh, whatever he needs, you know, he calls me, I'm down there. So, how did that come to pass originally? That was all through Cody getting yeah. getting those yeah. matches. Cody and Chris Jericho, yep, Chris Jericho and Cody and stuff. So, and uh, they got in touch with me and appreciated that. And hopefully, uh, it's it's a part time or a full time gig coming up. Hopefully. What do you think about how everything was run down there? Did you like it professional? Yes, yes, very professional. Great crew, a lot of young talent coming up. Um, and they got a lot of good old school guys there, enough, you know, like Lauren Anderson. And, you know, I know they picked up Sting and a lot of guys like Tully Blanchard and, and uh, Dean Malenko. And, they, you know, these this young talent can learn a lot from those agents and managers. When you get brought in there and you're in AEW, do you ever think like, oh, it might be heat, even though you were technically released from WWE? You think like, oh, there might be some heat if I work for AEW, or that doesn't work like that? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it kind of like I don't know, like because um, you know WWE said something about. It. Well, I mean, they did call me for a match a month or two later after they released me for Edge and Christian, uh, Edge and um, I'm sorry, Edge and uh, Randy Orton. But I was on my way to Texas, and there was no way I was going to be able to make it. They took, they thought I was still in Tampa, but I, unfortunately, I just was driving on my way with my wife to Texas, so I couldn't get back in time to do the match. Now, is that something that Edge and Orton want you to be the ref? Yeah, that's, you know, they they wanted me to be the referee of that match, you know, so, um, and yeah, I didn't get it either. I'm like, you know, the company's releasing me. 
but the boys still want me to referee their matches, which is awesome. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, but I was like, damn, like, you know, I, I thought I might be able to go out strong and retire soon and go out of WWE referee. So, but, you know, there was, there was word of something like, uh, it's never going to be pretty much a full-time gig anymore. If, if anything, it's part-time for WWE. So, but I haven't been back there since. So, Interesting though that that's got to be like an ultimate sign of respect though. Like, uh, no, we want Mike Kyoto. Guy doesn't work here anymore. No, we want Mike Kyoto. I mean, that's pretty good. Yeah, that is. It's a good feeling, and it's and it's been throughout my career when I was with the company. You know, um, you know, guys would even years ago they would say, "I want Mike Kyoto to do my match," and um, you know they they'd go to the agent, they would say, you know, and everybody would approve it and say, "Yep, great, okay, good," and you know, it was a great feeling when somebody wants you to do their match. As now, why do so, like some guys, certain guys want you, or why do certain guys want certain referees for their matches? Well, I believe it's the way you count, you know, your false counts, your one, two kickouts, um, false finishes, um, being very aggressive in the ring. It could be a bunch of different things. They know, they know you're always there for the spots, for the bumps when need be, or in certain things, and you could be called on when. We don't have a reputation of screwing the matches up in the business. I mean, you know, a referee is just important in a match, third man in the ring, as anything else, because you know, and the more the more you're you're not noticeable, the more you're doing your job as a referee. That's true. And yeah, that is true. Cause sometimes you're like, well, who was the referee there? It's probably a good thing, right? If you can't remember sometimes. That's a very good thing, you know, very good thing. So, I mean, Gorilla Monsoon used to always say that to me, too. And growing up in a business, the less you're noticed, the more you're being, you know, the more you're doing your job in the ring. Pat Patterson used to say that, too. You know, and he used to go, he'd be like, oh, that match. I was like, how'd you like that match, Pat? Oh, that was fantastic. It was on the place one bananas, the place one <laughs> You know, and then he goes, oh, you, who, did you referee that match? I said, yeah. He goes, ah, you did your job again. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even notice you. <laughs> that's awesome, man. Yeah, because yeah, that's one thing, you know. Chief Jay, you would do some things as a referee in the ring, play ha ha or do something. He'd come back and he'd be all over you. He'd be like, "When did you start campaigning? When did you start campaigning? <laughs> Are you the mayor?" And I'm like, "No, why, Chief? What's that BS you're doing in the ring?" He goes, "Let the boys. That's you know, you're not one of the boys. You're a referee." Okay, Chief, got you. You know, playing ha ha in the ring. <laughs> I'm like, no, I got you, Chief. You know, don't be going into business for yourself. Okay, you know, but and that's one thing with AEW. They have more of a, a referee has more of a character there. And uh, when I went to AEW, it was weird. Like my name, Jr. was putting my name over. They put me name on the screen. Like you are somebody. Because why not? Referees can be somebody. And um, it's one thing they cut off in the WWE a long time ago, a while ago. Yeah, because remember how over Tommy Young was in the NWA, you know, before his knee and neck injury, him right. pushing Flair and stuff. They're like, Tommy Young, the referee. Yeah. I mean, he was over like Rover. Oh, he was, man. Yeah, that little push spot. I love that. I used to do that with Triple H a lot. That was, that was, that would be some yes, yes. reaction. So that was some cool stuff. Triple H definitely Ric Flair inspired with that, yep. that spot. Yeah, that's true. Yes. Yep. Yep. Now, when you're doing that stuff, like to push spot, does it have to get cleared by anybody? Or is that just the wrestler says to the agent, like, we're doing this spot and, and we're going through? Like, how does that yeah, kind of get that passed? Works like that. It just, he would, you know, mentions it to the uh, agent. We're going to do this push spot, just get a little reaction out of the crowd, fire him up a little bit, get that done, show the referee's got respect in the ring and he's not getting, you know, stomped all over or buried. And it was just, it was a good little spot because the crowd used to go nuts all the time. So, and then, um, of course, definitely it was done on TV. It would have to get clear, clear by Vince. Gotcha. So, and anything these days gets cleared by Vince still. So, is he the? Uh, I don't know, not scary guy, but is he the intimidating guy backstage? That a lot of people kind of portray him as. Um, no, I mean he's not a scary guy. He's a businessman, and he's you know he's a strong businessman, stern, and he loves what he does. He loves what he he promotes, and he likes to see it done his way and um you know and that's why i was just like you know i would talk to him and be kind of quick conversations how, how are you sir how are you mike good you know this and that and in gorilla position if you wanted anything you know you would let me know what he expects 
out of that match or and he wants to make sure the referees don't get buried or they don't stupid and um you know was, he would uh just and he'd be yes sir no sir yes sir no problem get it done it'll be done now where does that come from him being a scary intimidating intimidating guy is that sometimes maybe fly off the handle or is maybe some bitter people trying to you know, well, some I mean, there's times he, float, he flies off the handle like any boss, you know, um, especially because, you know, things are, you know, when you're on TV and you're, you're trying to run your 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 product and your entertainment, you know, it's, you know, he thinks of it just professional entertainment business. You know, he, he wants it done the way he thinks it should be done. And he's got a great mind for the business because, I mean, look where, I mean, I've seen this business from holding microphones to boom boxes for the music at arenas. And you know, like taking yep. them and to go into like these luxury stages now and stuff like that. So it's it's a big difference from where we can, we started in the eighties and um, to now in two thousand twenty one. Man, the production, Vince, Kevin Dunn, those guys. I mean, the production is off the charts. Yeah, Kevin Dunn and all that guys and Marty Miller in the truck and and the camera crew's been with them for years and years. So and you know and that's the thing with AEW, they have um. Tim Wahlberg and, and another guy that used to work for WCW in the trucks. And I was always wondering why that their production looked very good too in their cameras and their shootings. And I'm thinking it's not easy to shoot wrestling, but there was two guys that have been doing wrestling for years in, in a truck at AEW and they do a fantastic job over there as well. With WB and, and AEW and stuff, who were some of the guys that, I know it was very few in AEW and it was Cody and Jericho, but who are some of the guys that like request to work with you? I'm always curious of that because they always say like uh, Jericho for a while, like Marty Elias or Michaels, like to certain referee or like right. who, like who is always kind of requesting you to want to work with you? Um, I mean, the rock always requested years ago when he was you know in the business and um, there'd be a lot of guys like edge request, Randy Orton and so forth. Um, and it was just, certain matches and main event matches and you know i would i would do the main event you know and uh there's a lot of main events i remember when you know earl got sick and boston garden it was wrestlemania there with stone cold and Shawn michaels you know and since earl couldn't do the match they they wanted me to do the match so that was you know thank god earl was all right and everything after that but i mean at least it was a, it was a good feeling that knowing that if Earl didn't do the match at that time, I was stepped up and I had to do, I was the next one to be there. Did they say anything to you about Michaels not wanting to do business that night? That's the big rumor. Undertaker was kind of lurking in case he didn't want to do business. Austin was ready to kick his ass for real. I mean, all these rumors are out there. Any of that sort of true with HBK being a, a hard ass at WrestleMania no, 14? No, I mean, I, I don't remember that as far as he didn't want to do the job. That's, that's for sure. Um, you know, his back was messed up. I remember his back was really messed up at that time and he was going through some major back problems. So I know we got through that match, but, um, that was not because we, re we rehearsed that with Mike Tyson and all that stuff. And he was in force on the outside of the ring. So, I mean, you know, he gave a nice quick three count, like a one, two, three. <laughs> <I> was, <laughs> that's what I've been teaching you for the last couple of days. I was <laughs> But it was cool working with Mike Tyson in there and everything. So, and the match went well. So, did they say anything to you afterwards? Like, how did you count or how did you teach him to count the three? That was way nah, too fast. I didn't say nothing. They knew it wasn't my fault, but <laughs> I knew it wasn't my fault. <laughs> That's for sure. But I mean, he was in there for, you know, a character, you know, he was oh, just yeah. for an enforcer. And, and um, it was it was great to meet uh, Mike Tyson at that point because he knew who everybody was. He knew who I was. I'm like, you know, my name. He's like, man, I watch wrestling every week. I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, I know you, Mike. And he's like, man, I know you too, Mike. He's like, Mike Kyoto. I was like, oh my god. I was like, how do you know the referees? I'm like, so he was a big fan. He was a big fan too. Now, he was a big part of the turning point, like where as far as hey, WWE was dominating for 83 weeks, they bring in Tyson, that starts getting some ratings. Then you tease Austin versus McMahon, and right. I believe April 13th, 1998 on Monday Night Raw, I was there in in Philly. I believe you're the referee for Austin, the first Austin versus Vince match. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's when you got to make sure the boss is he – was, and he's jacked up. He looked good. <laughs> he's still jacked. So, um, yeah, it was good. It was just – 
You got to make sure the boss, all right, Steve, you know, Vince wants everything done this way and this way and this way because he's never stepped in the ring too many times, you know, at that point. And um, Stone Cold's just like, yeah, let's go out there and have fun, kid. You know, just make sure if uh, I drop any beers, just get them to me. <laughs> <laughs> That night, it was awesome because being a fan, me, my brother, and my buddy, we went and right. we're just like, there was something in the air. And you knew that WBF was turning the corner and they were about to start winning. It was just something in the air that was very, very special. It was such a cool night. It's like, wait, Vince is going to wrestle Austin? Like, this is oh, awesome. Right. And then one tied hand behind your back. And like, it's such a good show. Unbelievable. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, you know, the crowd and everybody even backstage got a kick out of it because when you're, kicking the shit out of your own boss that's the owner of the company i mean the people are gonna pop you know like because he's such a good heel vince he's yeah. such a great heel and um i mean they just and they just they love it and stone cold was so over you know it's stone cold back in them days that was that was great too as far as just you know every night crowd popping and him just you know just getting that crowd going he'd come out and do his thing it was just stone cold the rock the whole attitude era in the late, you know, the late nineties going into 2000. So, and then there was just, uh, it was fantastic. Even, uh, you know, you got to remember nine 11 was 2001 September. And then some months later, that's when we had the rock and Hogan match and tore, tore the house down in Toronto, you know, and just yep. uh, coming off all that, you know, was, was pretty good. With, Austin and McMahon, especially Austin at that point. I don't think people realize, like, obviously the Hogan pop is huge. Road War pop is huge. That Austin pop is it's like, huge. as a fan, I mean, it's electric. It's not even like, oh, a few people are standing up. I mean, everyone oh, yeah. popped. I mean, know? as soon as that glass broke, you know, it just, poof, people knew they just came up to the occasion, you know. Same thing with Rock, you know, and, and as soon as his music would hit, the people would just come off their seats. You know, and Stone Cold just had a great look, man. I mean, he just, you know, bald headed look and coming down the ring. And I mean, he was good shape, you know, Texas boy. And um, and they just loved drinking beers and kicking your boss's ass. They loved him. <laughs> that they night, that night um, on Raw, like when Vince is in the ring, does Vince say anything to you about like, uh, you know, make sure like everything goes to plan or is he totally focused as a character? He's not, he's not in charge right now. He's Vince, the wrestler. Yeah. I mean, you know, he's, he's Vince, the character plus wrestler and wants to go everything to plan. And, um, you know, he's just calling spots back and forth or something like that or, and so forth. And, you know, he, if you would say like, okay, you know, what's he want me to do next? You know, cause really in there, like Stone Cold was the ringleader. When you have, you know, anybody that's facing Vince, is pretty much, you know, I know Vince is the boss, but he's not the ring leader. You know, so when you're just trying to take care of Vince and make sure he don't get hurt either. Yep. Gotcha. Now, yeah. is your role like even more heightened because it's Vince or is he just one another one of the boys to you? No, it's just it's it's a little more hyped when Vince is in there because you don't want to screw up and your boss is in there. That's for sure. So and uh you want to make sure he's happy with everything that went with the match because he's taking it just as serious as anybody else. As far as like big time, and I count Rock Hogan as like a main event, even though technically it wasn't the main event. How many like WrestleMania main events have you been a part of? Because I know it was 21, 22, 23, uh, 28, 31, 14. I might be missing some, but it was a lot you were the main event for. Right, right. Um, yeah, it was a lot of me. And I don't know how many exactly I was the main event for, but I know there was a lot. That's for sure. Um, you know, it's just. The Rock and Hogan, um, Rock and Stone Cold match when they, they I had the first 10 minutes of that match before I got my head ripped off with a chair. Yep. <laughs> and uh, so, I mean, yeah, that hurt for a few days, boy. My bell was ringing. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, it's just all the, all the, there, there were some great matches in there with Triple H and Batista and this one. And just so many phenomenal. I don't know how, how many exactly I've done, but I, you know what? I'm going to have to look that up. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty awesome, though. Like, you're like, hey, I have been in as many main events at WrestleMania as Hogan. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. damn, it's pretty impressive. Yeah. Well, I, I sure didn't sell tickets. I comp tickets. So, <laughs> <laughs> good point. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> how do you get that? How do you get that spot though? Is that that's just Vince saying like he wants you in the main event? 
Yeah, I mean that Michael Hayes, Pat Patterson when he was a big agent back then, and Michael Hayes is still the big agent, one of the producers over there. And you know, when you get the top agents and they they pick the referees too, they'll say to the talent, Hey, let's get so and so to do this match, we get this referee, get Charles Robinson, get John Cohn, get Chad Patton, or we want Mike Keogh to do this one. And that's how they they make the lineup. Got to be like a great honor, though, because this last match, the biggest match usually of the night, true. most important match of the night. No doubt. Yep, that is true. And like and like I said, uh, you know, most referees stress with commercial breaks and going off the air. So you got to hit your cues. It's very important. And you got to tell the boys that they got to get their cues on spot. Has there ever been a time where you're like rushing the guys or like, guys, come on. Uh, you oh, know, yeah. You get- oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Cursing up a storm swearing because i'm getting cursed at i'm getting sworn at you know when you're down to that 30 second mark and the finish has not gotten done yet and they need at least 10 seconds of them you know like gloating or doing something at the end or point at the wrestlemania sign yeah that gets stressful oh yeah oh yeah it gets a little intense any time where you basically had to like tell the guy like no cursing, whatever, but finish it before I get killed over here. I mean, come on, what are you? Oh, yeah, doing? no, that's that's it. I mean, that's like let's go effing home. Let's go now. I mean, we gotta go. We gotta go now. I mean, screaming, acts like I'm yelling at the wrestler, but I really am because I'm telling we gotta go home. You know, so I mean, it's just um, I've never, I've never in my career went off the air, not with the finish, not with the finish not being done always executed the time cues and gone off the air with the show. And that's probably why they wanted you for the main event of Mania. I mean, it's the biggest could show of the year, probably the biggest match of the year. Could be, could be, could have been, you know, so. You got you to gotta hit the uh, the home run all the way around. I'm, I'm just curious, is there a certain wrestler that you didn't maybe like to work with because they wouldn't hit their time cues? Um, You know, there's, there's a lot of guys that – there, you know, there's not nobody I really didn't like to work with or nothing like that. But it's just sometimes you have something laid out, and sometimes that time goes so fast in the ring, and you, you hate to rush a match, and you just got to go over your time limit. But you know, and that's that's happened a lot too, where they've gone over time time cues, and then they've had to take in a match off the next match, time off the next match. So, hope oh, you're cut three minutes because they went over three minutes. That's normal. So things like that happen, and you know, and sometimes more matches go over five minutes or eight minutes, and the back gets hot a little. You know, the agents get hot, but it gets worked out. Did Michaels ever get in trouble? Because he always says, like WrestleMania twenty five, for instance, they gave him and Undertaker like fourteen minutes, and him and Taker looked at each other like fourteen minutes. We're going at least twenty. So it's like, did do they ever get in trouble? Like, or does the ref get in trouble? Does the agent get in trouble? Like no, when that I mean, happens? Well, it's, I mean, sometimes everybody gets a little you know, reprimanded, but they know it's a talent and a talent take the heat for it. And the, uh, the referee, they, you know, you, they know the referees give them the cues. And so, I mean, yes, I mean, sometimes, you know, like, uh, Sean, I mean, Sean and, and takers match, Charles Robinson had that match. So, I mean, you know, and Sean and taker, they can use up the time and get no heat. That's for yeah. Sure. Yes. Yeah. But, it's, uh, yeah, you know Michaels is going to use it wisely, and it's going to make the match better rather than like go home already. Exactly, exactly. Especially him and Taker. You know those matches were phenomenal. I love them. Watching that match, I wish I had that match. Charles Robinson had that match. <laughs> I was going to say, is there any matches you wish you had rather yeah, than? Probably that's one of the matches I do wish I had. That, that Taker Sean, you know, definitely. That was a hell of a match. The first one there too. Um, Remember correctly, were you the ref for Razor Ramon One Two Three Kid when One Two Three Kid did the like the crazy upset? Sure was. Yep, that was a that was a great feeling in that Manhattan Center. You know, a great vibe, New York crowd. Um, it was just a great wrestling place, a theater. You know, it was like, like a tower theater place. And um, yeah, that was that was awesome. I was in that bow tie with the blue shirt and a little in a mullet back there. Yeah, the mullet back then. <laughs> <laughs> But what a pop and what a reaction I got. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Pretty good night. Now, as far as like actually wrestling, I knew you had at least one match. I think it was you, Jericho, Rock, against the Dudleys and Nick Patrick in the Alliance era. 
did you ever get any kind of any more inkling like man this is great i want to wrestle some more or was this like yeah i shouldn't be out there no i shouldn't be out there yeah i was kind of like that was cool to do that was awesome with i mean look at y2j chris jericho and and the rock and the dudleys and then nick patrick you know and uh it was a great time it was a lot of fun and um yeah but i didn't want to be doing that every night that's for sure <laughs> it was too late in my career to start wrestling that's for sure how do they say like hey we're, we were doing this wcw versus wwf thing we want you to wrestle like how did it even come about yeah i mean that's why i showed up to the arena that day and they, they were like look you're you're going to be wrestling I said wrestling i don't have wrestling gear he's like oh you're gonna be wrestling in your referee gear i said what and they, they told me you know it was six man and so it was great. I had a lot of fun with it. And I was just hoping I didn't screw that people's elbow up too much. <laughs> <laughs> don't screw this up. Don't trip. Don't fall. <laughs> and don't kill Nick. You know? yep. So, yeah, but I had a lot of fun with that. And that was one of my uh, moments in my career that I liked a lot. I can never say, you know, I, I don't even remember another referee having a match like that, to be honest with you. Few and far between, for sure. Yeah. Now, did you think like you should have some more matches after that, or or no? You, no. you didn't think you were that great. No, let me just uh, <laughs> let me let me go back to ref, and that's all. <laughs> that's it. Stick to what I know. Now, you got to talk about this because you mentioned it before too. Though the release last April from WB after thirty one plus years. I mean, you were there for so long. You said you were a bit shocked by it, a bit surprised. Did they ever give you like a reason of, of why it happened? Like Brawler 2 got released and Rotunda got released. I mean, a I bunch know. of guys got released. No, I don't know. I mean, Tony Chimmel was 38 years in the business. I was 35. Um, John D'Amico was 32. And I just had dinner. I seen John D'Amico last week, went out to dinner downtown Tampa and seen some of the referees and stuff. Wanted, they wanted to hook up for dinner and stuff and see each other. So it was great seeing them guys, a bunch of guys like Chad Patton, Charles Robinson, and Sean Bennett, and uh, Ryan Tran, and John D'Amico. So it was great seeing those guys. And it's just, yeah, there's no reason. Like, when I got the call, I thought it was going to be more of a pay cut. But, and then when it happened to Tony Chimmel and, and John D'Amico, and John D'Amico, I just moved to Tampa knowing that I was close to, to the PC that you wouldn't even have to pay for my flight to come in. You know, I could, cause I was driving down there and helping training the reps. So I was working my shoulder out. I was injured for about six, seven months because I had bicep and um, rotator cuff surgery. And I had Dugas in Alabama, they had Dugas in Alabama do it for me. Did a great job, but I was ready for WrestleMania. And then the pandemic hit, I mean, it was a great thing. It was like, wow, WrestleMania is in Tampa. I had just moved to Tampa and so, I mean, it was all like, uh, it was just a complete shock. I thought it was going to be about more of a pay cut than a, a release. Did they give you a reason or was it just because of the pandemic they were just cutting all the old, like the old timers kind of? That's, that's what it was. I was just, I guess so. You know, they, they really just they just said, oh, yeah, we're, we're, we're losing so much here. But then you're hearing the company did its best revenue and just its best things. And they're selling, you know, the network and just recently, but a year ago, I think they did they had their like best quarter ever, you know. Yeah. And they released like guys that were with the company for 30 some years. It's insane. Like you're like, okay, pandemic, okay, it's a good excuse. But then you look at their bottom line, like you said, it's like, holy crap, they had two of their biggest quarters ever in a row. It's like yeah. like right. they didn't need to cut anybody. Right, exactly. I mean, they they took care of me on pay for a while, you know, for quite a few months. And so that was very nice. I mean, they don't have to do that either, but I mean, uh, you know, it is what it is. So it's just, you know, one door closes, another door opens up. You know, it's just, it's weird and calling Tony Chimmel and keeping in touch with him and his wife and his family. And and he don't work for the company either anymore. It's like, just, it's a weird feeling. You know, it's just like, wow. So, you know, he's just, he said, look, it's time maybe to live a normal life <laughs> instead of traveling and all. I mean, because, you know, when we were busy, we traveled so much in our career. It was just, I mean, over 50 different countries and a lot of countries in and out of every country, all the little towns in Italy, England, here, there, South Africa, Japan, China, Korea, Singapore, so many places, all over Canada and all over the United States and all these little towns in the United States. We've been to like everywhere, Tony Chilma and I. And, so it's kind of like, in, in other words, maybe uh, you get up at eight, go to work at nine and come home at five. <laughs> so I'm starting to do that. 
Yes, yeah, not a normal everyday job. That, that, that's uh, for sure. Definitely yeah, not. Definitely not. No, it was traveling was like, you know, my profession was travel. I love it. And you could have never, went, you know, you would never with any other sport, you couldn't see the world like you see with the world wrestling entertainment with wrestling. Does it make it any easier or harder that all you like your friends are kind of released with you or, or guys, you know, for years are released with you? Or does that even make it harder? It's like, oh, we all got released like this is terrible. Yeah, I mean, it's it's it doesn't doesn't make me happy to see anybody get released, especially during a pandemic. Um, we were, you know, kind of like, wow, just during a pandemic. Well, we've been through the thing, you know, the ups and downs of the company so many times, whether WCW was going to put us out of business, whether the scandal years ago was going to put us out of business, whether this was going to happen. Um, and in the pandemic, it's like, so how do we go out and make our money when there's no work and no nothing going on really, you know? So it's kind of um, just waiting for things to open up. Yeah. It's like, they're the only game in town. Obviously AEW runs, but yeah. all the other promotions stop running. Everybody loves AEW because now you have somewhere else to go. So it's it's great to have competition. And Tony Khan and them guys are doing a great job over there. And Cody and Y2J and all them. Great job. If you look at it, it's like Christian, you know, he's back wrestling, big show, Jericho, Cody's yeah. from WB Tech. I mean, a lot of guys, uh, Matt Hardy finding homes in AEW. That's correct, right. And, you know, like you always heard they weren't going to pick up too many WWE guys, but they picked up. The right ones i think and hopefully i get there full time so hopefully uh, you know i'm there full time at some point like they are know. lacking a senior referee i don't know if you've noticed that right yeah like I kinda, the leader of the crew right i mean they uh, need a, a lead guy yeah they all do a great job the referees right but yeah i mean you know it's it's um yeah i would love to be down there helping referees out there doing matches and helping refs and working with that young talent they got coming up in AEW. that'd be great now, I always hear Jimmy Corderas, obviously, yeah. former WWE referee. I always hear him saying that they making the uh, referees look bad. Yeah. You ever get that sense? You ever think like, oh, you're making the ref look bad? You ever get that feeling? Yeah, I do. I definitely do. I know where Jimmy's coming from, too, and stuff like that, you know. Um, and yeah, it's, it's 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 a lot of things where a referee could, you know, work with the talent and, you know, can we shorten this spot up so I'm not out there with for 15, 20 seconds and just – with my thumb up my butt, you know, just sitting there going there and yep. looking stupid or, um, and you, of course you don't want to, you know, you want to see things when your back needs to be turned and somebody's supposed to take it. Just a lot of things where you can work with the agents and work with the talent. And they do care about the referees. That's for sure. They do care. Cause when I was down there, they did care about rules and, and the regulations and stuff. So. I remember there was one spot, I forget who was in the match, ever, but Audrey had to like walk by the cheating because the person came up on the apron on the wrong side. She had to like walk by and she like, it was so bad. I was like, yeah. man, they made her look so bad, but, she, but what was she supposed to do? That was the spot she's right. supposed to get distracted with. It's like, oh right. man. Right, right. Yeah. If somebody comes up on the wrong side and stuff like that, that's totally, uh, you got to be on the same page. And that's, that's hard for the referee. I mean, that's, that's nothing the referee can do is just try and, try and protect herself as much as possible. And during that spot, she's got to just try and protect herself as much as possible. And, and that's it. So, I mean, it's when, and there are screw ups like that. So, I mean, it's going to happen. I feel like sometimes the ref has to be the ring general, but sometimes the guys don't want to follow suit. So it's like, Oh, come on guys. <laughs> that's true. That's true. That is true. Now, as we hit the wind down and head towards the finish, I'm just curious about this. Cause I'm thinking like, as a fan, it's like, all right, I'm watching, let's say, Rock Hogan. You ever get caught up in the match and almost, like, lose focus because you're, like, watching the match along with it? Or is that, like, you're oh, too yeah. professional? That would never happen. Well, there's times, yeah, I've been professional never happened. There's there's a few times I did get caught up in a match, to be honest with you, because, you know, even though you know these guys and they just do such a fantastic job, some of these guys got so much character and get the crowd going whether it was John Cena, The Rock, and Hogan, and John Cena would get that crowd. They'd be booing him all over the world the first 10 minutes of the match. And the last 10 minutes going home, they'd be cheering for him. Um, it was just weird. It's it's, it's great because you get caught up in how these wrestlers can get the people, you know, and Miz on his promos or this one and Paul Heyman and Brock Lesnar. And it's, just, it's just phenomenal to see so many different people work with so many different characters in different ways. I would get caught up. I'd get caught up on Paul Heyman's promos a lot because I, I loved his promos, you know. 
Bray Wyatt, when Bray Wyatt used to do his backstage interviews and his his you know his promos, oh my God, he's he's great at cutting promos. Kind of not feeling a demon character now, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. right there with you. The fiend, it's so weird. Yeah, it is. It's just it's a little it just throws me off a little bit. And I'm not sure what they're going. I mean, I love Alexa Bliss. But I'm not sure what they're going for with like how she's dressing. Like it's supposed to be like a little kid, or like I don't, I don't kind of don't get it. It's weird. I don't get it either. So yeah, it's a little, you know, yeah, it's a little weird. So I don't know. <laughs> I know. And then they burnt them alive. <laughs> yeah, I see. I seen Randy post something or something on Twitter or somewhere like, "Thanks for cost me twenty thousand dollars to bring my family to wrestle a demon." <laughs> 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 I went on. They probably made. He probably had a lot of family there, and he made him pay for all his tickets. Yep, for sure. Damn. As far as kind of, you know, working WWE for so long, and and just being around. Do you have any regrets in, in wrestling? Anything you like weren't able to do, or anything that you didn't get to that get the chance to be a part of? No, not really. I really have no regrets. It's been a, it was amazing thirty five run thirty five year run. I mean, it's been great. Um. You know, it's unfortunately, it's what I know how to do best is refereeing. Um, do I want my career to end right now? No. You know, I, I still got a few more good years left in me, that's for sure. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm hoping to definitely, I mean, I've traveled over 50 to 60 different countries, a lot of beautiful places around the world. Didn't get to see the whole world in 35 years, but I've seen a lot. And it was just, it's an amazing, it was an amazing experience. There's, like I said, you can play in, professional football, baseball, anything. And you're still never going to travel like professional wrestling does. As far as podcasting, I know you do some stuff with the uh, ad free shows with yeah, Connie. Yeah, yeah you... with Paul Bromwell. Yeah, Paulie's taking care of me, Paulie B and uh takes care of me on there and Conrad Thompson and everything and ad free shows. Yeah. Monday now back with uh, Mike Keogh on Monday nights coming up. How did that all come about? Conrad reached out to me. So he reached out to me. He said, now, I think you probably have a lot of fantastic stories. And I've heard, you know, I've heard your, your career has just been amazing. And um, so, you know, and he's, he's, you're interested in doing podcasts. And I said, yeah, sure. I said, you know, as soon as uh, WWE stops paying me, then I'm, you know, I'll be pretty good to go do some podcasts. And so we, you know, I reached back out to him and we got hooked up and they're, they're, Teach me the ropes on this podcast, though. This is something totally new. I'll tell you, that. <laughs> you like doing it, though. You like answering yeah. the questions, and yeah. sometimes they can be a little off the wall. I'm sure. Yeah, some off the wall, but you know what? Like you know, like yourself today, very intelligent questions and very nice questions, respectful. And that's what that 99 percent of the times I'm getting intelligent, respectful questions and and nice comments from fans too. So it's really I've been enjoying it very much. It's it's really nice to see. How many people and how many fans out there appreciate what the referee did? What the referee yeah. did. That's I feel sure. like as the fan kind of evolves, they're getting a little smarter. Uh, maybe they're not really watching as much current, but they're listening right. to podcasts and they're getting smarter. Like, wow, the referees, the importance level is higher than we thought. Right. And even like, you know, sometimes these these younger uh, fans, you know, with wrestling fans, and I'm going, wow, he's only 20 some years old. And then you forget, it's like, oh, he's been watching the network. That's why goes back watch the network and you could watch and they probably pop even more when they see me in the ring 31 years ago as a young kid you know so yep but um yeah it's been a it's been cool doing these podcasts and and everything and looking forward to doing a lot more and i got another podcast up here in a couple hours very good as far as kind of dark side of the ring too yeah. are you doing more stuff for them or is that just kind of uh yeah, did something uh Let's see, John, I did, that was, um, the Brett screw job was done a while back and I did something in December and that's for June. I think it's coming out in May or June then for the next, their next segment. And that's some about the flight, uh, the flight from hell. And, uh, and then, yeah, they called me to do something else coming up here soon. So yeah, it's pretty cool. It's been, a, it's been pretty nice working with vice too. Nice. Look at that. Keep him busy for sure. They do a good job on that dark side of the ring. They do. Yeah, I like job. it. I really do. I like it. And Conrad, Conrad's now is uh, doing doing Vice and doing Dark Side of the Ring. Yeah, he's doing the Confidential Show. Yeah, which yep. which you were part of. Yeah, very cool. Yep. Yeah, real cool. So that's awesome. As far as what's next, what's next on the horizon for you? Like, what what do you got planned? What are you thinking about? Where do you want to be? Well, you know, we, we've been taking some time. We, we want to travel a little bit, me and my wife, because everything's been pretty shut down for the last year. 
And uh, we've been just going all over Florida right now and, and you know, a little bit back and forth to Texas. That's where she's from. Um, back in a little bit back and forth to Jersey, see family. And we, we want to travel a couple more places, Aruba, and just, you know, don't worry about anything. Just relax. Have a, you know, and then if something comes up, you know, I mean, I'm, I got a lot of appearances coming up. Uh, I work for a landscaping company part time, designing uh, uh, landscaping and palm trees and landscaping for homes and stuff. And so I do that on the side and I'm keeping busy, you know, and we get to enjoy a lot of beach weather in Tampa. Yes. Beautiful and, down there. Yeah. Clear water, Siesta Keys, uh, Tarpon Springs. And we will go down to uh, St. Augustine. She loves that area, my wife, and enjoy it over there. That is awesome. Now, as far as your social media, where everybody can find you, where can uh, everybody kind of find you or they want to book you or whatever, where can they get in touch with you? Yeah, that's at, on, on Twitter and it's at MJC Kyoda, C H I O D A. And that's, uh, that's my Twitter handle. And, uh, and I have some shirts with a third man in the ring, just a new, new design coming out. And, uh, Paul Bromwell helped me out with that and had free shows. And had, that's at pro wrestling tees. Good stuff. Love it. Hope to see more and more and hear more and more for you. You've got such a, a great mind for the business and you always tell them some great, great stories. And I, know, I love hearing from you. It's a good, some good stuff from you. And obviously you've been around the block over 30 years in WB. Pretty impressive. Yeah. Right. Been around a block a few, few decades, I'd say <laughs> three and a half yeah. decades. <laughs> a lot. You know, you would say normally like a guy was in WB for like three years. You'd be like, well, um, 10 times that. So it's pretty yeah. impressive. I know. I know. We always joke around when somebody was in you know, when you're in a relationship for like six months or a year ago, oh man, that was a good run for a year. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, like, it's it's been an amazing run. It's like I mean, when you see the old school wrestlers that used to come to the Hall of Fame, it's like, oh my God, you're still here, Kyoto. <laughs> yeah, no, it's like, yeah, it's like, don't say it too loud. <laughs> yeah, don't ruin it. Yeah, yeah, but anyway, so unfortunately, you know, I mean, it, it'd be nice if I can finish off my career with AEW or train referees or do whatever I would, you know, I'm up for anything. So we'll see. All right. Awesome stuff. Mr. Kyoto, thank you so much for all the time today. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me on, John. Appreciate it. Maybe there's another time. Let me know. We'll get together. Absolutely. Definitely. Right. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. And be safe in Jersey. <laughs>